this time we'll release for nursery if you'd like to to go to nursery this morning. Uh, if you'd like to read along with us this morning, we're going to be reading from uh, 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, uh, the 33rd verse. The 33rd verse. Uh, and uh, probably some scripture there that is uh, so, so familiar. Uh, you know, uh, those, especially for those that have been coming on Wednesday night, you'll know that we just came through that, uh, came through that scripture just a little while back and uh, you know it was uh, it was about um, it's a little bit about how that uh, you know David and and how they was talking about David and his uh, his walk and what he's been doing we studying on Wednesday nights <clears throat> and uh, we have uh, been studying a little bit about that but you know I, I happened to think about something this week and uh, as I, I went to, uh, got to go on kind of like a little mini vacation and got to go to Texas for a work conference. And as I was sitting there, and it's amazing how thoughts hit you sometimes and where they hit you at. And as I was sitting there at one of the conferences, they were telling a story about a man that we will, uh, I'll also tell you about here lately. I, I, I will say this is not an original uh, guy that I would have studied, but, but I will get to him directly. But uh, it was a it was a guy that was brought up, and and as I was sitting there thinking, and I was hearing this story, it brought to me a, a thought about our Christian life and about how that we attack things. And if I were to ask you this morning, if I were to, to ask you to do me one favor, I want you to think of one impossible spiritual thing that you can't do. Now, whatever that would be. Well, I can't witness. I can't sing. I can't. I can't teach. I can't do those things. And I'm sure if I were to ask you this morning, what can't you do? Okay? What, what can't you do? I want you to think of that. And when you have thought of that, I want to get interactive with you for just a moment. When you have thought about that thing you can't do, please raise your hand. Okay? There are those things, you know, I, I've been there before. I can, I can share my experience. I can't preach. I, I, I can't. I can't. I told the Lord so many times, I can't preach. I can do anything else, God. I can, I can, I can sing not well, but I can sing. Uh, I can pray. Maybe not as, I'm not at the prayer where someone else is, but I can pray. Or I can teach Sunday school. I know I've been taught enough Bible in my life that I can, I can reflect what I've learned. And, and I can be an adequate Sunday school teacher. Uh, you know, I, I always told the Lord the things that I, I, I always tried to bargain with God. But there was always that thing in my life that, that I held out of that one thing that I can't do. And, and I remember for, for me for such a long time, it was I can't preach. And I remember the day, and I've told you all this story before, but I, I, the day that I announced my calling to the ministry, I, I was sitting across the living room floor from Andrea, and, and, and I told her, I looked at her, and I said, I said you, you know, and she gave me some really good advice. She said, until you become honest with yourself and to God, you'll never be free of what's burdening you down. Now, that's good godly counsel from a good wife, okay? And, and I looked at her, and I'm sure at that moment she would probably like to retract those statements because I looked at her and I said, well, the Lord is wanting me to announce my calling to preach. I'm sure at that point she's probably want to say, lie about it, lie about it. <laughs> Don't be honest. Don't be honest. And... and but I told her, I said, you know, and, and she looks at me and she gives me, you know, that look. She goes, well, I'll just be honest with you. She said, I don't know how to be no preacher's wife. I said, well, that's good because I don't know how to be no preacher either. <laughs> I said, I ain't got a clue how to do this. I've been in church all my life. I've been around preachers all my life. And I don't have a clue on how to be a preacher. I, I don't even know where to begin to start. I know that it starts with the Bible. I know it begins with salvation. But other than that, I don't know even how to start to be a preacher. I can't do that. And for so many of us, we have that thought in our head of what we can't do. I can't speak in front of people. I can't teach Sunday school. I can't do this. But who is telling you that you can't? Who said that? You know, as we read here in the 33rd verse of, of the book of 1 Samuel 17, chapter 33rd verse, we find that David is going out to fight Goliath, okay? I mean, we all know the story. Most everyone here knows the story of, of David and Goliath. I mean, little David, big Goliath. You know, little shepherd boy, huge warrior. You know, and, and as he's coming to Saul and he is telling Saul, he said, listen, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down and fight Goliath. Here's what Saul tells him. And Saul said unto David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine, 
to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Now I'm going to stop reading right there. Do you see what Saul does? Saul tells him, he said, listen, David, you can't do this. You cannot go fight him. You are not qualified. You are not big enough. You are not strong enough. You are not the person that is able to fight against him. You can't do this. For so many of us, we live in a world where we're constantly being told we can't. You're a Christian. You can't speak out. You can't share the Bible. You can't witness. You can't testify. You can't do these things. And who is it that is telling us that we can't? Because it's not God. It's not God. God is never telling us that we can't do anything. I told you that I was going to tell you a story about a, 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 the man that I, I listened to, and I'm going to bring him in at this point. Anybody here ever heard of Al, uh, Alfred Ernest Clifford Young? Probably not. I never heard of him until this week. Albert Ernest Clifford Young, better known as Cliff Young, was a potato farmer in Australia. Not a very popular guy, right? Never been married at that point. Lived on his little potato farm. Raised a few sheep. Here's what Albert, Clifford, Albert Ernest Clifford Young did, though. They had a, an ultra marathon. I don't know if you're familiar with what an ultra marathon is. A marathon is 26.1 miles of running, okay? I would like to think someday that I would be physically capable of doing that. So y'all laugh when you look at me. Okay, so Paul Harvey says, stay tuned for the rest of the story. They did the same thing to Cliff Young. They laughed at him. He showed up to run marathons when he, in 1979, 81, 82, and as he was going in 83, he decided he's going to run an ultra marathon, 544 miles. Okay? 544 miles of, of a man who... The previous attempts, he had actually finished the marathon, but it, it was like way down on the list. But, I mean, he was 59 years old when he ran that one. So at 61 years of age, Cliff Young decided he was going to run an ultra marathon. Not a professional runner, not a professional athlete, nobody that ever had any formal training. He decided he was going to run 544 miles. Now, that in itself is, I think it's amazing that somebody would show up at 61 years of age and say, hey, I'm going to run an ultra marathon. That kind of ambition is unheard of. Can you imagine today if, if we had that kind of ambition as Christians? That we would show up and say, you know what? We're going to attempt the impossible. Just even attempt the impossible. To even think we will attempt the impossible. Clifford Young showed up in his overalls and steel toe work boots to run 544 miles. The newspapers that were there, this is from from Sydney to Melbourne, the, the, the newspapers that were there, actually, they said in one print, called him an idiot in the paper. That a man that was 61 years old with no formal training would show up in work boots and overalls to run 544 miles, and yet here he went. At the sound of the gun, he took off running. At the end of the first day, he was so far behind everybody else that they had even almost forgot that he was even running. If it hadn't been for him being assigned a number, they wouldn't have even known. But here's the crazy thing that happened. To run an ultra marathon, they say the best way to run that, and it's the, the approved way by runners, is you run six hours, you rest six hours. So you run for six hours straight, and then you stop, and you allow yourself bathroom breaks, food intake, a little bit of rest, your team rest, and you go on. Poor old Cliff didn't know that's the way you're supposed to run an mar ultra marathon, so he just kept on running. He never stopped. And his work boots and overall, he never stopped. He said, huh. I don't know where everybody stopped before. You're supposed to be running. He just kept on running. He ran for two days straight. Kind of sound like Forrest Gump, don't it? <laughs> and he ran, and he ran, and he ran, and he finished. And, and, and these were professional runners he was running against, and he finished the race 10 hours ahead of the second-place person. First place at 61 years old in steel toe boots and overalls. And you know why he said that he did that? Because nobody told him he couldn't. 
Nobody ever told him that you weren't supposed to do that. Nobody ever told him that there was a limit to what you could accomplish. Nobody ever told him that there was a limit to the way you run, there was a, that you have to wear this or you have to be this way or you have to be physically fit or you have to do all these things. He was 61 years old, a 61-year-old potato farmer in overalls and work boots, and the man wins an ultra marathon at 544 miles. That's unheard of. The reason I told you this story is because when people tell us we can't, we get it in our mind that we can't. If somebody would have went up to him before the race and said, hey, you can't do that, that's impossible. You know what he would have started thinking? That I can't do that. That's impossible. And the reason that we as Christians, it matters to us as Christians, is because the world is telling us so much of what we can't do that we start believing that we can't. You can't witness, you can't testify, you can't talk about Jesus, you can't lift up the name of the Lord, you can't live a fruitful Christian life, you can't live as a good Christian, you can't do these things. There's so much things that you can't do. You cannot possibly do all those things. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Start throwing away all those people that tell you that you can't in your life and start living life like you can. My, I told you all the story about my uncle when I was a five-year-old boy. He handed me, a, and for those of you who have ever been around at the back of the field, probably not many, it's, it's a dying thing with my generation. Not many people younger than me remembers what it was like to raise tobacco, but when I was brought up raising tobacco, and, and they would bring us a, a bundle of sticks about five foot long, tied in a bundle, okay? And there was probably about 30 sticks, 25 to 30 sticks per bundle, five foot long, and about two by two square, Okay? And, and, and it wasn't just ordinary sticks. It wasn't like there was this little old light pine. You wanted your tobacco sticks to be strong. So a lot of times they were out of oak or out of some kind of hardwood that would withstand the pressure of having tobacco hung off of them. So these were pretty heavy in the bundle, okay, especially for a five-year-old boy. And I remember my uncle coming out and telling me, he said, I want you to spread these sticks, and you spread them two by two down the line so you could pick them up, and you could cut your tobacco, and you put it on. And my uncle said, I want you to spread these sticks for me. My first words to him as a five-year-old boy was, I can't. What did my uncle do? He didn't, he didn't say, okay, yeah, it's a little heavy, buddy. It's okay. No, that wasn't my uncle, okay? My uncle Norris was not, he was not coddled as a youngster, neither would I be. So he grabbed up a tobacco stalk and he started swinging it at me, swatting me with it. He chased me all through the field, swatting at me with a tobacco stick. When he finally got tired of running after a five-year-old, because I was light, I, I could outrun him in a long-distance race. I could have been a Cliff Young. And, and he got tired of me. He said, listen, he said, he said, I never want to hear those words out of your mouth again. You never say the words I can't. He said, figure it out. So I went back to the bundle of sticks, and I looked at it, and I was like, what did I do? So I pulled two sticks out, and I took them, and I put them down. And I pulled two more sticks out, and I went a little farther and put them down. And I pulled two more sticks out, and I put them down. And pretty soon, I had the whole bundle spread. And he said, I knew you could do it. You just got to figure out how to do it. You got to think about it. You see, the reason I tell you that story on top of the other one is because don't say the words I can't, okay? There should never be a time in a Christian's life that we ever use the words I can't when it comes to Christian service. Because why? Because with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. In the book of Mark, the ninth chapter, uh, if you, I'm going to run here real quick. Uh, I, I promised Jesse I'd never do this because Jesse told me, he said, Dad, he said, never become a flipper, but I'm, I'm going to be a little bit of a flipper today. Um, <laughs> He said, Jesus said unto them, he said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. All things are possible. All things are possible to the person that believes. Can you imagine today if we just believe? If someone were to say, hey, listen, I need you to help fill the choir up. Well, you know, and I'm sure that, that I'm speaking for Darren whenever I say this. Darren so many times he says, hey, listen, we need to have enough people to fill a choir. And we have more people that say, I can't sing than people that say, I, I can sing. Guess what? I can't sing. I understand that I'm not a professional. I understand that I'm no Mark Hall or Zach Williams. I understand that. I understand that I cannot sing as good as someone else. But you know what? God gave me a voice. Amen. And here's what I've noticed. That if you get enough men standing together singing off key, it actually starts sounding like it's on key. If you get enough men that cannot sing, then it starts to blend together, and people actually believe you mean to be that way. And that's intentional. And so many times we say we can't, and we are limiting the people who are out there that can. Saul wasn't the only person to tell David he can't do that. 
There was a whole army. His brothers told him, you can't do that. There was a whole army back there saying, you can't do that. The Philistine himself said, you can't do that. And I'm sure in David's mind somewhere he's saying, you know what? I don't know who you guys think you are, but I've got God with me. And God is telling me that I can. God is telling me that I can do this. So that one impossible thing that I had you think about, start thinking about it now. That one thing that you can't do, all of a sudden, guess what? God is saying you can do it. You can witness. You can sing. You can testify. You can lead something. You can lead a, a group. You can, you can be a Sunday school teacher. Guess what? And I'm going to tell you something that may really shock you. You can preach a message. You say, Brother Randy, well, that's not me. I was there, and I said the exact same thing. I can't share the gospel. Why? Well, people are going to laugh at me. People are going to talk about me. People ain't going to listen to me. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't listen to anything else, i got everybody to listen. That's something that would never happen. That's what I always tell them. I said, nobody will listen to me. And I just got everybody to listen to me just by saying listen to me. See, because you all didn't know what's coming next, did you? <laughs> See, that's the thing I always said. I said, God, nobody will ever listen to me. Nobody will ever hear what I have to say. And the whole time, I was gauging it because I was thinking about what I could accomplish. I was looking at my strength. I was looking at what I could do. And you know what? In myself, I can't do anything. But through Jesus Christ, I can do all things. Which, by the way, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. I can do all things. Now, now when, when he made that statement to the Philippians, you notice what he didn't say? He didn't qualify that. I could do all things. Well, I could do some things. I could do what I want to do. I could do what's cool. I could do what's not cool. I could do. He didn't say this. I could do all things. It doesn't matter what it is. I could do it. What do you need me to do? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Preacher, what do you need me to do? It doesn't matter. I could do it. You need me to testify? I could do it. You need me to teach Sunday school class? I could do it. You need me to work in Bible school? I can do it. You need me to sing? I can do it. Why? Because Christ sentences me. I can do it. Can you imagine if we started living our life with an I can do it attitude? Can you imagine today how our Christian lives and our churches would change if more people would live with an I can do it because Christ is in me attitude? Hey, I don't need somebody telling me I can't because you know why? Because the Bible tells me I can. Amen. Satan will tell you you can't. Your friends will tell you you can't. Your church people will tell you you can't. Everybody may say you can't, but you know what? The Bible says you can, so do it. Do it. What is it? I don't know. It's different for everybody, right? I can't sing. I can't teach. I can't do that. I can't even forgive myself. Brother Randy, you don't understand. You don't understand. I, I would do that. I might be able to sing, and I might be able to teach, and I might be able to do all these things if I could just get past my, my failures of life. Can I tell you something? That, that the, the singing sounds really good, and the preaching part sounds really good, and the teaching part sounds really good, but you know what else that you can do? You can get forgiveness for your past transgressions. Amen. You know what you can do? You can outlive your failures. You know what you can do? You can rise above the muck and mire of the life that you have been a part of. You can do all those things. See, it's not just those service things that I'm talking about. It's the life things that I'm talking about. It's those things that you think that are holding you down that can't possibly let you lift yourself up. You can rise above those things because why? Because Jesus Christ strengthens you to do it. Amen. I can do it. I don't have to accept failure in my life. I don't have to not run the marathon because why? I'm going to be honest with you. If Randy Norton does not ever finish a marathon, you know why he doesn't finish a marathon? Because he's too lazy to do it. Because guess what? I might not be the fastest. I might not run with the best form. I may even have to stop and rest many, many times throughout the, the course of the race. But if I want to finish a marathon, you know what I can do? I can finish a marathon. I can do it. If I want to do something bad enough, I can do it. My dad is a realist, and he gave me some good advice one time about church. I told him I was, at that time we were struggling to get people to come to church, and, and I said, Dad, I said, I just don't get it. I said, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand why that people won't come to church. And he said, son, he said, you can't make people do anything. 
And I said, I know, Dad, but I said, I'm just, you know, it's, it's just kind of frustrating sometimes when people don't come to church. He said, son, he said, let's put it this way. He said, he said, if I want to be at church, he said, you couldn't put enough chains around the door to keep me out of it. He said, I'd get me a blowtorch, and he said, I'd cut every chain. He said, I'd get me a saw, I'd cut everything. And he said, I'd walk in there and proudly proclaim that I made it because I wanted to be there. And he said, and if I don't want to be there, he said, there ain't enough dozers and chains to drag me into the church house. He said, you'll do whatever you want to do. You see, so that then becomes the key, does it not? Cliff Young wanted to run an ultramarathon, so he ran an ultramarathon. Strong people lift big weights because why? Because they want to lift big weights. People accomplish great feats because why? Because they want to do that. The only thing that holds us back from serving God more and better is not the fact of whether we can't, not what somebody's saying. It's the fact is that we just don't want to put forth the effort. I just, you know what? If it was easy, if it was convenient, I would do it. But you know what? It's not easy or convenient. I'm going to have to put forth a little effort. I'm going to have to overcome some obstacles. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to believe in myself. I'm going to have to do some things that normally are not me. I'm going to have to get outside of my comfort zone. I'm going to have to do some things that normally I wouldn't do. But you know what? I want to do it bad enough I can do it. If I want to share my testimony with a lost person, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go find a lost person. I'm going to share my testimony with them. If I want to sing bad enough, you know what? It doesn't matter how many people sit there with a look like... <clears throat> It doesn't matter. You know what? Because I'm not singing for you. I'm singing for God. Amen. It doesn't matter what it sounds like to you. Now, don't get me wrong. I'd like for it to sound great. I would like for it to sound wonderful. I would like for it to be a blessing and sound like the heavenly angels in heaven just opened up their mouth and, and it came forth. But there's a good chance I know my voice. It's not going to be like that. But you know what? I'm singing for the Lord. If I preach a message, you know what it is? I, I don't preach the message to make you all feel good about yourselves. I don't preach the message to, to let you look at me and say, man, Randy, that was just an awesome message. I'm just spot on today, preacher. That was really good. Because if I just preach you messages to make you feel good about yourself, then I'm not really doing a good job. When I preach messages to you that the Lord gives me, I hope and I pray that more often than not, you leave here feeling challenged. You leave here feeling that, man, I've got to work. I've got, there's something about this. I've got to get to it. There's lost people dying to go into hell. And because there's lost people dying to go into hell, I've got to get busy. I can't live in my state of fear. I can't live in my, my state of can't. I can't live in the state of, of I, there's no possible way I can do this. I need to look more on the side of, hey, Jesus, you said that I can do it because you'll strengthen me to do it. I'm going to go, girl, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to step out, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to step out. In the book of Luke, here's one that, that you'll really like. In the book of Luke, the 10th chapter, 19th verse, says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all power, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You say, now, Brother Andy, that's not quite right. That's not quite right. I mean... The other day we were driving through Mississippi and Andrew hit a Andrew hit a, a snake the size of a piece of stove wood. <laughs> and for 20 miles she was like, <laughs> there was no way I could convince that woman to go back and tread on a serpent. She didn't want to tread on a serpent with a set of Michelins between us. I'm not telling you to go out today and find you a snake and pick it up. I'm not telling you to go out today and find scorpions and play with them. What I am telling you today is that God gave you the power over the evil of this world. Amen. All this craziness that's going on, this, this woke culture, transgender junk that's going on, let me tell you something, they've tried all this before. This ain't the first time this has happened. And let me tell you what happened before. They went up against the all-time, undefeated, undisputed, heavyweight champion of eternity, which is Jesus Christ, and lost. Amen. Amen. And they will lose again. Because as Paul found out, it is hard to kick against the pricks. Because Jesus don't go to lose. Jesus came and won. And through and by his victory, guess what? We have the victory. 
We have the ability and we have the power over all the power of the evil one. We can rise above every bit of it. Every bit of it. And it's going to look big and it's going to look scary and there's going to be people telling you you can't do it and the whole time you got to say, you know what, Jesus said I could, so I will. Jesus said I could, so I will. I will take that one impossible thing that's on my list and I will mark that off my list. I'll mark it off. Well, I, you don't understand, Randy. I can't talk to my family about this because, you know, my family's lost and, and they've got a lot of issues going on. And if I talk to them about it, they may never speak to me again. Yeah, they might. Or, or, you could speak to them about Jesus and they could act like they didn't hear, but the Word of God could penetrate and the seed could be planted in a ground that God has already prepared and it could grow and blossom into full salvation. All things are possible. You see, the only reason that it may never be known is because you're saying, I can't. I can't. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Who's telling you today that you can't? I'm telling you, you can. The Bible tells you you can. How many people in here? Now, I'm going to get a little bit more interactive today, okay? Now, this is where I'm going to put you on the spot, all right? And then, then this, this, this is scary honesty time, okay? Now, we've all heard the jokes, right? You better be careful about telling a lie because you're in the church house, right? Now, I understand full well that probably on any given Sunday, there's a bunch of lies told in the church house, okay? If I ask, does anybody have anything you'd like to say, there's a bunch of lies. I ain't got a thing to say. You'd say anything anywhere else. You can dismiss the service, and we got all the things in the world to say. But when it comes time to say it for the Lord, nobody's got anything to say, which is a lie, because we've all got words of praise that we should be saying. But now here's where I'm going to ask for a moment of, of just brutal honesty. Brutal honesty. Okay? If you think that you can overcome the impossible through Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't believe it, don't raise your hand. Okay? Because I would rather you not raise your hand and be honest about it. Say, well, Brother Andy, I, my faith ain't there. I'm just, I can't overcome it. That's fine. That just means you're in a moment of weak faith. That's okay. Everybody has them. But now if you're sitting here and all of a sudden you realize that through the power of Jesus Christ and the victory that he won for us through and by his resurrection, that the power of God now rests upon those that believe in him and he does empower us to do all those things that we think we can do. If you think you now can do it, raise your hand. I can because you know what? I've thrown so many roadblocks in front of God and told him what I couldn't do that he's just mowed them down one right after the other that I now realize he can. If he can take me and make a preacher out of me, he can do anything. And I'm not saying that because I was a bad person. I'm just saying that because I was a weak person. I was a person who, who I, was just, I was just weak. I was just, I, was, I lacked self-confidence. I lacked the, I lacked the ability to, to be able to stand, I, I, was just, I was just not the right candidate for being a preacher. Out of a, out of a list of 150 people, I would have been 150, okay? I would not have been that guy that anybody would have ever picked to be a minister. There's no way that I should be where I'm at right now. There's no way, if you look back on my history, there's no possible way that I should be standing behind a pulpit bringing a gospel message to a congregation like this. That is just an improbable thing that should have never happened in my life, and here I am, praise God. And not that I'm the best, and not that I do a great job, but I'm going to tell you something. God can work many, many miracles. I look through my life. There are so many things that I said that I can't do that God said, oh, yeah, you can. Watch this. Watch my power. Watch my power do this. Watch my power knock this one down. Watch my power make a mountain out into a molehill. You believe you can throw that mountain in the sea? Well, just all you got to do is say it. Over there it goes. You say, Brother Randy, you don't understand the hurdles I'm facing in my life. No, but I understand the God that can get you over the hurdles. And that's just his nature. 
It may be health. It may be finances. It may be relational. It may be job. It may be, it may just, you may just not even know your direction in life. And you know what? God can get you over top of all those. Why? Because he already knows what he's doing. See, I'm going to go ahead and let you in on a little secret in case y'all haven't figured this out. God is not a rookie, okay? This ain't his first day of showing up on a job as being God. He's been God for a long time. And he will be God for a long time. And he's very experienced at being God. And he knows how to win victories. And he knows how to overcome. And he knows how to make mountains into molehills. And he knows how to solve your problems. And he knows how to give you love and strength and health and peace. And he knows how to do these things. So just put some confidence in him, okay? Amen. Treat him like he knows what he's doing. I want to ask them if they will come and get a sign in a moment. There was a movie that came out several years ago, a movie called The Ghost in the Darkness. I don't know if anybody ever saw it, but it was a story about two lines that, that roamed the Savo area of, of Africa, and they were killing all these railroad workers. And they called for an expert hunter to come in. And as he came in, and he started saying, well, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. The doctor of the, the film, he came in, he goes, well, you can't be doing that. You can't be doing that. And he turns around and looks at him. He says, sir, he said, when you question me, he said, you act like I don't know what I'm doing. And he lays his gun across his shoulder. And he says, now, I know you're not telling me I don't know what I'm doing. And the doctor says, oh, no, 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 you're, you're good. The reason I told you that story is because that's so many ways, that times, the way we treat God. God comes in the midst of our services. God comes in the midst of our lives, and he's telling us, he said, hey, if you'll do this or you'll adjust this, if you'll pray here, if you'll study here, if you'll share here, if you'll do these things, then great things can happen. And we say, well, God, you can't do that. You, 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 that's not the way it happens. That's not, that's, that's not the way we do it here in the Baptist church. We don't, do that. We, we, you know, we don't raise our hands. We don't shout. We don't scream. We don't holler. We don't cry. We don't show emotion. We don't do any of these things. We, that's just not the way we do it, God. And God looks at us and says, now, when you say that, you're telling me that you don't think I know what I'm doing. Now, I know you're not telling me that you don't think I know what I'm doing. Anybody here think God don't know what he's doing? I didn't think so. So that means that whatever God tells you to do, that you're going to do it, right? That whatever God leads your heart to do, you're just going to go ahead and do it because God has empowered you. He's given you the ability. You can accomplish the impossible, and now when God impresses whatever it is upon your heart, you're going to say, you know what, I can do that because God told me I could. So now it's on you. You see, God placed the message on my heart. And God allowed me to deliver the message to you. And the way, the way that he done this is he said, now you have something to do. You have something to accomplish. You have some hurdle to jump. You have some mountain to climb. You have some enemy to fight. And I want you to know that you can fight them. And you can climb it, and you can jump it. Because why? Because I'm with you, and I'm empowering you to do this. You are empowered by God Almighty to accomplish the impossible. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. So whatever it is today that's in your life that you're trying to put between you and God's service today, remove that hurdle. Get it out of the way. Say, okay, God, it's done. I'm done with it. Now, my personal life, my personal story, the day that, that I announced my calling to ministry, I was sitting about the same place I was when I got saved, about the third pew back at Island Ford Baptist Church. And I was sitting there, and I was, I was so ready to move. I mean, I was like a runner waiting on the shot, right? And the shot went off. The invitation was given, and I went, and I froze. And I looked around, I'm like, God, are you sure you want me to go? You got another bullet in that gun? One more shot, Lord, and I'll, I'll, I'll run. But, you know, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to talk to you about this first. I'd like to bargain with you one more time. And you know, people will say they have audible conversations with God. I don't know if this conversation was audible to the ears, but it was to my heart. And God's not a smart aleck, but he, he said this. He, he told me, he said, okay, you spend a few more weeks like the most miserable ones you've spent up till now, and then I'll see if you're ready. And I said, Lord, I am tired of being miserable. I'm tired of being burdened. I'm tired of feeling down. God, I want whatever it is to be released in you. 
And I'm going to be honest with you. I could not have scripted a more blessed life than what I have. I could not, if, if I was a kid going back to grade school and they said, write about a blessed life, I could not have wrote to you about a more blessed life than what God has provided for me. Today, let, let that burn be released. Let it go in God and say, yes, God, I can. And watch what happens next as we stand, as we sing.